Okay, good morning. We are, we're going to get right into it. We're in John chapter 5. We, at the beginning of the year, started a new series uh, that in, in the book of John called Living Your Best Life. And uh, this series is probably going to take us through the end of the summer. And uh, so maybe even longer. We may just take the next two, two years and go through this. Like we, and we, no, I don't know who else is looking forward to that, but I am. Anyway, so um, last week what we talked about, I just want to recap this a little bit if you weren't here. And all of the messages are available online on our website and also on, on YouTube and uh, Facebook. So we, we talked about the woman at the well last week in John chapter 4. So Jesus comes to this well, and while he was there, there's a woman, a Samaritan woman comes out and begins this dialogue with him. And, uh, and so she's trying to argue with Jesus about religion, about some different things. And, and Jesus just stopped her right, at, right in the middle of her sentence and goes, go call your husband. And she was like, I don't have a husband. And Jesus goes, you're right, you don't have a husband. You've had five husbands. And the dude you're shacked up with now, isn't, you're not married to him. And so what we see about that woman is she, she had been divorced five times. And I said this last week, look, I probably made some people mad. I, I generally try to do that. I don't try, but I generally do that. And, uh, but, but she's just not a woman, like she's a relational train wreck. She's not a woman, she's not a person who gets relationships right. That's all right, doesn't make her a bad person. But if you're married, I, I just pointed out that she's not, like someone like her is not someone who you want to go get marriage advice from. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? Like, like why would you, if it, like I'm married and I really want to, you know, love my wife the way God calls me to, so I wouldn't go find someone who's been divorced five times and go, what do you think I should do? Because they don't really know, you know. I mean, and I talked about that last week and I wanted to just further that a little bit. So here's what I want you to do. This is just some practical. There's, there's married people in this room, younger married people. You've been married for under 10 years. You need to find somebody who's been married a long time and, and go ask them, how do you do it? Like Mary Beth, how long have you been married? 41 years. And so, so go talk to Mary. If you're a woman in here, go talk to Mary Beth. Say, how have you lived with Chuck for 41 years and not strangled him? You know what I mean? Like, how do you do that? How do you not murder somebody? Uh, Luann is down here. She was here last week. She's been married 62 years. 62, right? 60, man. Uh, that's a long time. That's longer than most of you guys have been alive. And so they've done, they've done it right. And so you should just go. Some of you, some of you younger women should like, call her up and say, let me take you out for coffee and, and get a pad and pen and be like, give me some tips. You know, how do you do it? This is amazing. All right. So that's what you want to do. All right. Let's get into this story. John chapter five. I'm going to recap it uh, as we go through. We're going to start in verse one. It says, after Jesus returned to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish holy days inside the city near the sheep gate was the pool of Bethesda with five covered porches. Crowds of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, lay on the porches, uh, waiting for a certain movement of the water. For an angel of the Lord came from time to time and stirred up the water. And the first person to step in after the water was stirred was healed of whatever disease he had. One of the men lying there had been sick for 38 years. Now, just want to pause right there, and let's just talk about this passage, okay? We're going to dig into this. So what do we see about this man? There's a man who's been, like, there, there's this pool where, you know, whenever the water's stirred, the, the thing is you you got to get in there. But this guy, we don't know what his ailment is, but he's been sick for 38 years. I mean, it probably has something to do with him not being able to stand up because he talks about, I can't get in there. And uh, later, Jesus heals him, and he tells him to stand up and take up your mat and walk. But, but we don't know exactly what it was, and, and we, know, we don't know how old he is. Like, he's been in this condition for 38 years, but how old was he? Did, has he had it since birth, and he's 38 years old? Or is he 58 years old, and he's had it for, since he contracted that whenever he was 20 years old? So we don't know a lot about this guy, but we know that he's in a desperate situation. He's laying there, and Jesus walks by. Verse 6, when Jesus saw him and knew that he had been ill for a long time, he asked him, would you like to get well? Now, I got to confess to you that when I first read this years ago, when the first time I ever heard this story, I thought to myself, that's a stupid question. You know, like that's a dumb question. But I know 
Like, I'm not calling Jesus that. I know Jesus is smarter than I am. He's smarter than you are. And, and so whenever he asks questions, it's for a point, right? Just like last week, whenever Jesus told the woman at the well, go call your husband. Like, he was doing something in that. That was packed with meaning. This question is packed with meaning. And so let's talk about that. It's not a stupid question because the reality is that, you know this, right? Not all sick people want to get better. Do you understand that? Like, like it, what we do, what I do, I've been doing this for 20 years as a pastor. And um, whenever I first uh, started my first church 20 years ago, it was down in the inner city, down at 12th and Bales, 12th and Prospect area. If you, It's the place where you don't want to break down at night, right? And that's where I was at for 12 years. And it just had a lot of homeless people around there. And so I got very familiar with you know, drug, you know, the people who are in drug addiction, of course, I, I myself am in, in recovery and just dealing with a lot of homeless people, you find out a lot of things. And so one of the things that I found out was that not everyone in that condition, whether or not, you know, just because they're homeless doesn't mean they're a drug addict and an, or an alcoholic. That's not necessarily the case. A lot of homeless people are that, but not all of them. Some of them, for other reasons, have become in that situation. But whether it's you're addicted to something, drugs or alcohol or pain pills, or you're homeless, or you have some other ailment, I, I, I know that by personal experience that not everybody wants out of that condition. And that might, seem, might sound crazy to you, but let's get into this. I want to just talk about this for a minute, and I've got some things for you to write down, some notes about this. The first thing, some, some reasons why somebody with an ailment or a situation condition, why wouldn't they want to get better? The first one is, number one, is because you become accustomed to your condition, right? There's a lot of people who just get used to it. Like, it's just the way that I am. It's never going to change. This is who I am. You're just complacent in that. And that's a sad place to be. The second way, the second thing is this. You take advantage of your condition. I've seen a lot of people uh, learn to take advantage. Of, they've got an ailment. They've got an addiction or whatever, whatever's going on. And they actually try to take advantage of the system. And I'll tell you a few stories, or a couple of stories. One is, so when I was down in the city, pastor, and I've told this story before if you've been here for a long time, but uh, we, used to, we used to work with homeless a lot. And one time I went down, all the way downtown, and there was this man under a bridge. And it was summertime, and I was just talking with him. I was trying to share the gospel with him. With him and, and I just started finding out, what, I was like, tell me about how you got here, man. What, what was your situation? Uh, he's a military veteran, and uh, he's been homeless for a long time. He was like, I'm, I've been living under this bridge for a lot of years. He goes, summertime is, feels great. You know, I feel like I'm camping. Uh, the wintertime gets a little bit rough. You know, I can just imagine as cold as it gets here in Kansas City. He goes, but I have a lot of people that give me stuff and take care of me and all of that. And, uh, and then I've started digging in a little bit more. And, and I was like, well, what, what is your situation? How did you get here? And he just told me he's, a, he's an alcoholic and a drug addict. And um, he goes, I'm actually on disability. He goes, I get $1,900 a month, a check. He goes, I go to that bank right there and, and cash it every month. And, and I was like, what are you on disability for? And he goes, well, I'm an alcoholic. And I was like, I didn't know that that's a disability, but, what, you know, whatever. And so he's, um, so he's got this situation where, and I just started talking to him. I, I, I thought it was kind of funny, but it's not funny, but I was like, bro, you've got, you get $1,900 a month, you know, every single month. You could have an apartment. And he was like, well, he goes, I don't know about that. I go, let me run the numbers for you. And, and I go, $1,900. I was like, take $500. You could have a furnished apartment, right? All utilities paid. I was like, take another few hundred dollars. You could have a car with insurance. You could have food. You could have utilities paid. All your stuff. You, you pay all that stuff off. And you'd still have $400 a month to go get, to go buy drugs with. You know what I mean? And then some of you don't think that's funny. I, I thought it was funny. Uh, but it was, but, but it's the truth. What the guy needs is to get on a budget. He needs to go through Dave Ramsey's class. But, um, but, but what I discovered about that is, and he actually told me this. He goes, I like living under the bridge. He goes, I don't want to live in a house. He goes, I, I'm comfortable here. And that blew me away because I just, I couldn't imagine. I like camping. But I also like to come in and take a shower when I'm done, you know. So I just, uh, I just realized that there are some people um, who, 
some, some people just get accustomed to their situation. Some people take advantage. And, and people learn how to game the system. The, the, one of the problems is, and I'm not going to get into a political rant, but what, in America, you can get free stuff from the government. The government's writing out checks left and right. And it's hard for people to, you know, it, it, it's likened to if you go to some of the forests, some of the uh, national parks, there's a sign that says, don't feed the bears. You know why? Because they'll learn to be dependent on that, and then they won't, they, they won't remember how to go out and kill stuff and, and fend for themselves. I heard about this one guy. It's supposedly this is a true story, but I don't, I've not verified this. But this goes way back to the 1960s, and Vietnam War was going on. And some of you guys were around then, and some of you guys could probably tell me some stories. But so in the Vietnam War, they started drafting people. They started drafting men to, be, to go off to Vietnam. And a lot of guys were trying any number of things. In fact, I'll give you a little, this is a little secret. Uh, the Bible college that I went to, the, the one that we uh, support, Baptist Bible College, um, in, our, in its heyday was, the, was around 1975 in the early 70s, and we had like 2,500 uh, students. One tuition was free at that time, but the other thing was there were a lot of people going to, going to Bible college so they didn't have to go fight the war. Okay, so, but one, I heard about this one guy who did this in the 60s and so that he didn't get drafted into the war. He went to the dentist, and this, this is what he did. He had all of his teeth removed so that he would be unfit for service in the military. I'm like, that's, that's dedication. <laughs> I mean, I, that's a, I, I don't know. I think I'd rather go fight than go get all my teeth removed. But anyway, so, so there are some people that have learned how to take advantage of, of their condition. Number three is some people have an enabler. You know what I'm talking about? Like there are, maybe you have a loved one who's an alcoholic or an addict and you keep enabling them. I'm just telling you, if you keep doing that, they are never gonna get better until you learn to say no and say, you're gonna have to figure it out for yourself. I can't keep enabling you in, in whatever way you do. And so I'm just telling you, so a lot of people don't get better because they have somebody providing a place for them to live. They give them food. They give them all this stuff to take care of their needs. Meanwhile, they're out ruining their life. And so you got to stop that. Number four, the fourth way is this. The fourth thing, uh, a lot of people have given up hope. I see it all the time. People are in a situation, a condition. Maybe they're an alcoholic or addict. They're homeless. They're whatever. They got physical ailments, and they've just given up all hope that it's going to get better. And I'm just telling you, from a worldly perspective, it may seem like that. But from God's perspective, if you have God in your life, there's always hope. Hope is a powerful thing. Hope could be the one thing that gets you through. In fact, if you don't have hope, it's hard to go on. That's when depression sets in. And that's when people start to have suicidal thoughts. They just think there's no way out. But there's, with God, there's always a way out. All right, let's get back to the story. I'm going to finish this out. So, so Jesus looks at this guy and says, do you want to get better? And in verse 7, he says, I can't, sir, for I have no one to put me into the pool when the water bubbles up so someone else gets in ahead of me. And so I want to pause right here, and I want to tell you about what I studied. I studied this out years ago, and I found, came to this con conclusion, okay? Um, and so a better reading of this, if, you, if I were to translate this, um, well, let me, let me give you the, the next thing is that this guy was trusting in his superstitions. Because I want to I wanna give you some things about this man that I've discovered that I see in the passage. And one was that he's given up hope because he's trusting in a superstition. And the reason why I say that is you can go look at commentaries, and most Bible scholars agree with me, or actually I agree with them. And what it is is that they look at this passage, and it really should say, instead of saying that an angel comes and stirs the water from time to time, it just says, like, the legend is... Like the rumor has it that they, like this is what people say that an angel comes. Because the reality is no one's ever been healed by that. You understand what I'm saying? Like there's no details about this. There's no, no one's ever been documented to be, to have an ailment, ailment and then get in the water and poof, they were healed. That's never happened. So this man was standing there. He, he was sitting there all day long, every day, 
hoping to get in the water, but even if he could get in the water, it wasn't going to help him because it was just superstition. And the reason why they know that is because years later, they actually dug it up and they found that, that the water was there because it was fed by some underground artesian springs. And from time to time, it would flow in and create some bubbles underneath. And that's why the waters would stir. And people would see that and go, an angel's touching it. We need to get in. And they would fight to get in there. Problem was, nobody ever got healed from that. It was just a, a rumor. It was a superstition that they had. So I started thinking about that. And I want to just do a little pause because we are, as Americans, we're a pretty superstitious bunch, right? Uh, people in this room, you've got some major superstitions and, uh, and maybe minor ones. But I'll, let, me, let me show you how it works for a lot of people. Um, I love watching the Chiefs game, okay? And, uh, and sometimes it can be nerve-wracking, right? You, you got people like the Chiefs or some other team, it doesn't matter. You like sports. It can be nerve-wracking watching that. But I'm blown away because there are some people, even in this room, that believe that when you're watching your team, that you can do something on your couch that's going to have an out, uh, effect on the game and change the outcome of the game. You know what I'm talking about? People, if I, if I would have just worn my lucky underwear, we wouldn't have lost, right? Or I got to wear my lucky socks, or I got to wear this same jersey every week. I mean, there are lots and lots of people that believe that if they wear their lucky jersey, they are going to, um, their team's going to win. Remember 2015 when the Royals won the World Series? And uh, if you, like, whenever we started losing, uh, you'd look up in the stands and, and everyone would, remember the rally caps? Remember what that were? Everyone would be like, all right, we got to do the rally caps. And you turn your hat inside out and you put it on. You look like an idiot. And you're just sitting there looking stupid. Think, but you think, you know, we won the game because I turned my hat inside out. No, you just, you're an idiot. That's what, I mean, that's what happened. I don't, I don't know. Um, so people do any number of things like that. Um, but... And I, I came across, I have two funny videos that we're going to watch. One is, this first one is a, uh, it's a Coke commercial that's similar to, they're watching the game. Let's watch this. And then uh, we were talking about this in staff meeting this week, and Matt, my youth pastor, was like, there's a great video on, uh, th there's a great scene from The Office about this, so let's go ahead and check this one. This is just six seconds. I'm not superstitious, but I'm, I am a little stitious. <laughs> so maybe you're superstitious or a little stitious. Okay, look, I feel convicted right now, so I... I didn't mean to call anybody stupid or an idiot because I feel like I fit into that. I, just this year, I, uh, I remember watching the Chiefs game and they were losing and I shut it off and went in the other room. When I came back, they were winning. And I, I had the thought like, huh, maybe there's something to that. But I know, I know it's, it, there's nothing to that. Like I had no impact on the game. I don't, I don't know why we do that to ourselves. So I started thinking about this. We'll have a little bit of fun. So what are, some, what are some superstitions that people have? Just throw them out. What are some, maybe yours or maybe other people's, but there's a, any number of superstitions people have. Step on a crack, break your mama's back. Yes. You step on a crack, you break your mama's back. When I was a kid, I used to find every crack. We had stepping on it. Anyways, it never worked, but what else? Black cat walking through. Yes. Black cat. What is it? Don't what? Okay. I don't know if I heard that one. Don't walk under a ladder. All right, show this next slide right here. This was, you'll get a kick out of this one. <laughs> That's a double whammy right there. What else? What else? Don't, oh, I do that all the time. I do it just to spite people. People like Cindy, like when I see an umbrella inside, I'll pop it open. And they're like, stop. I'm like, what? What is going to happen? Like there's not, I don't believe in bad luck. What else? You break a mirror. What happens if you break a mirror? Seven years bad luck. That's some of your problems. Like you, your biggest problem is you broke a mirror six years ago. Now, anyways, um, what else? What else? 
throwing salt over your shoulder like in Dumb and Dumber. Just threw the whole salt shaker. Anyways, yeah. What else? Oh, yes. I hate those. Please don't send those to me. Like, you don't love Jesus if you don't share this. And I'm like, I don't love you. Like, you're blocked. You know, like, I don't, I'm just saying, like, it, that bothers me. That bothers me. Like, you don't know my heart. Put me on a guilt trip like that. Anyways, yeah, that one's great. Um, what else? Oh, okay. I don't know if I've ever heard that one. All right, let me read through some of these that I had. Some of these have already been mentioned. Um, Friday the 13th is an unlucky day. Oh, you know what I found out about this? I never knew this until just a couple days ago when I was doing research for this. So I found out on YouTube, so you know it's got to be true. But um, So why the, the number 13 is unlucky? I never knew this, but it goes back to Jesus. There was Jesus and the 12 disciples makes 13 around the, the Last Supper. And so since then, they said... The 13 is an unlucky number. And even going back to like medieval days, like over, over in Europe, like they would never allow 13 people to sit around a table. And uh, even today, you can go downtown Kansas City and see some of the taller buildings. There's no 13th floor in there. Have you ever seen that before? It goes 12 to 14. They skip, they skip the 13th floor. Just, all of that's just superstition. Um, how about a, a lucky rabbit's foot, Right. It really wasn't lucky for the rabbit, but, you know, it might be lucky for you. Um, if you find a, a four-leaf clover, that's supposed to bring you good luck. Has anyone ever found one before? Yeah. Uh, let's see what else. Um, don't walk under a ladder. Black cat. Um, let's see. Oh, horseshoe. If you find a horseshoe, you're supposed to, it's supposed to bring you good luck. Um, let's see. Gar yeah, garlic protects you from... Vampires and evil spirits. Um, at the end of the rainbow, what what is it? Oh yeah. Uh, at the end of the rainbow, there's a pot of gold. Um, if you blow it when it's your birthday and the candles are lit and you blow all the candles out, what happens? You get your wish. Except you don't. But uh, anyways. Um. Oh, what about this? You ever done a wishbone from a turkey on Thanksgiving Day? You get the wishbone and you and a friend like break it and whoever's got the bigger piece is supposed to get your wish or whatever. I don't know. Also doesn't work. Um, I also never get the big end. Uh, also, another thing is cats supposedly have nine lives. Um, I can tell you from experience that they don't. I'm just telling you, they don't. Uh, and, and then the last one is that uh, toads cause warts. They, they don't. They, they don't. Somebody tried to argue with me in the first service, too. They're like, yes, it does. It doesn't. Warts, I mean, uh, toads did not cause warts, okay? It was on Mythbusters. I watched an episode of it. Anyways, so, but here's the thing. Like, Christians, like, I don't believe in luck. Like, as Christians, we're not supposed to believe in luck. Good luck, bad luck. We believe in God, okay? And so I don't believe that things are left up to random happenstance, but... There's a lot of Christians who live their lives as if God is like a good luck charm. You know what I mean? Like they treat him like that. And so we have to be very careful about that. So the, going back to what the story is, so this guy was in his condition for 38 years, and he was trusting in a superstition. Now the second thing about this guy is that if you write it down, he didn't have any friends, which is sad. Because that was his lament to Jesus. He goes, I want to get in there, but I don't have anybody to help me. I don't have any friends to pick me up and throw me in the water, right? And, and so that's sad. And, yeah, I mean, I'm, I don't have a lot to say about that. But if, if you feel like you don't have a lot of friends, I know the Bible says if you want to have friends, you must show yourself to be friendly. And I've talked to people who have told me, man, I don't have, a, I don't have any friends or a lot of friends. And I'm like, there are people that will hang out with you, but you have to put yourself out there. There are other people at this church who would love to be your friend, but sometimes people are so introverted. They, they, here's what people think and they have told me before. Oh, I'm sure nobody wants to be my friend. Well, with an attitude like that, you're never going to get any friends. You have to put yourself out there to get some friends. All right, so that's, that's the number three thing or two. The, second, the third thing is this. This guy had an excuse. Just, just write it down. He had a built-in excuse. Um, it wasn't his fault, right? He was sitting there. He was laying there day after day. He wants to get in the water, 
but he ain't got no one to put him in there. So he just had this excuse of why he is the way that he is. And I don't know the guy's heart. Like, I don't know the situation, but I know a lot of people have, a lot of people are in a situation similar to this man where their life is just not right. And, and they've always got an excuse of why it's everyone else's fault. Okay. You have to learn personal responsibility. I've talked to people and they say this. They say, well, it's my parents' fault. It's the way I was raised. My parents didn't love me. My parents didn't want me. My dad abused me. Um, my dad didn't spend time with me growing up. Um, somebody else, when I was growing up, hurt me. Um, you know, if, if I was born in a better neighborhood, maybe I would have had better opportunities. If I had a different family. I hear people say this. I was born, I, I was raised in a dysfunctional family. Well, who wasn't? You know what I mean? Like, I don't, I think every family's dysfunctional. It just is. You're all weird. We're all just a little bit weird and jacked up. And so I don't even know what you would consider a dysfunctional family. But I, I do know this. I do know that God can overcome those things. And I'm looking at miracles in this room right now of people who have, who have been raised up in a bad situation. And in spite of that, God has turned your life around, and he's putting the broken pieces back together. I want to read to you this story. This is from an article. I'm, it's pretty lengthy, but I'm going to read this article from a guy named Marshall Hayden. And here's what he wrote. And, and as I read through this, just think of our church because there's a lot of similarities. He says, uh, it, it says, would, the title of this is, Would Every Non-Herter Please Stand Up? So non-herder, people who, who don't hurt, and no one stands up. He, said, he points out that people come to church wearing their best clothes and their best smiles. Everyone looks happy, so we assume that everything is okay. But he suggests that we need to look beyond the facade and realize that the pews are full of hurting people. He wrote, over here is a family with an income of $550, uh, $550 a week, and an outgo of $1,000 a week. Over there is a family with two children who, according to their dad, are failures. You're stupid. You, you never do anything right. He is constantly telling them. The lady over there just found out, j just found a tumor that tested positive. The Smith's little girl has a hole in her heart. Uh, Sam and Louise just had a nasty fight on the way to church. Each is thinking of divorce. Last Monday, Jim learned that he was being laid off. Sarah has tried her best to cover her bruises uh, from her drunken husband uh, inflicting when he comes home on, on Friday nights. Um, that teen over there feels like he is on the rack, pulled in both directions. Parents and church pull one way, peers and glands pull the other. Then there are those with lesser hurts, but they don't seem so small to us. An unresponsive spouse, a boring job, a poor grade, a friend or parent who is unresponsive, on and on the stories go. The lonely and the dying and the discouraged, the exhausted, they're all here. And when I read that, I thought, that's our church. Like every Sunday, I know I'm looking out at people who are just, every one of you has a story to tell. And every one of you has brought baggage with you today. And every one of you guys are probably hurting in a little bit of a different way. And so sometimes, a lot of times, people come into church and with a fake smile and a facade, just a and we ask you, how are you doing? And you go, I'm good, I'm fine, when you're really not fine. And there's something freeing about being honest with yourself and transparent and learning to open up. But you got to have friends to do that. you got to be connected into the church, a church family that loves you enough to, we won't judge you when you come clean with what's going on, but you have to be honest about where you're at. And so let's go back to this story in verse 8. Here's what it says. Uh, Jesus told him. So, so Jesus comes to this guy, 38 years been in this condition. Jesus goes, do you want to get better? And he's like, well, I, I would, but I, I don't have anybody to help me. You know, when I get there, someone else gets there first. He's just got all these excuses. And so Jesus just looks at him, verse 8, and he goes, Jesus told him, stand up, pick up your mat, and walk. Now, I want to pause right there because if you, if you can just imagine the scene going on, this guy, you know, it, this takes an element of faith on his part. He's laying there, and Jesus says, stand up and pick up your mat. Now, he could have argued. Some of you might have argued and been like, I just told you. You know, I'm here for 38 years. I don't have anybody to help me. I can't walk. But Jesus goes, stand up, pick up your mat, 
and walk, and the guy obeyed. That takes faith right there. Verse 9, and, and all I want to say about that, listen, for some of you guys, when Jesus tells you to do something, just do it. You don't have to argue with him. He's smarter than you are. If he told you to do it, it's because it's going to work out. Okay, verse 9 says, instantly the man was healed. He rolled up his sleeping mat and began walking. But this miracle happened on the Sabbath. So the Jewish leaders objected. They said to the man who was cured, you can't work on the Sabbath. The law doesn't allow you to carry your sleeping mat, to carry that sleeping mat. I read this and I was like, are you kidding me? Are you, seriously, this guy had just been healed by Jesus, 38 years in this condition. And the Pharisees, I tell you guys about the Pharisees all the time because they're, they're church people, they're religious people. They're, they're more spiritual than you are. But they had, in Jesus' day, the Pharisees had written their own book. So they had, the, they had the Bible, the Old Testament Bible, with all the rules that are there. I think that that's enough. But they were like, you know, we need to come up with some more rules. Now, in Jesus' day, they had to keep the Sabbath. You know what day the Sabbath was? It was Saturday. Saturday was the Sabbath. So on sa if you were a Jewish person that day, you weren't allowed to work on, on the Sabbath. Like you had to stay home, and, and it was serious business. Like they, you know why? Because God wants us to rest. I think, look, I don't have time to dig into all this, but some of us, myself included, do a horrible job at resting, you know. I'm, I'm always on the go. Some of you guys, you haven't had a day off in months, and, and you just go, go, go. And even on your day off, you're go, go, go. Well, God set it up in the Bible. He says, work for six days of the week, and on the seventh day, rest. And so I feel like it would be good for some of us to learn how to rest on the Sabbath. But in that day, I mean, it was literally, you could be put to death if you didn't keep the Sabbath. And so what the Pharisees did is they wrote this book, and they said, they, they just came up with all these little interpretations of it. Like this, they go, if you're walking on the Sabbath and you step in mud and you go like this and you go over to a house and you like wipe off the mud or some dog poo or whatever, you wipe it off like that, they said you can't do that because now you're working because you, that's considered uh, stuccoing the house. And I was like, that's, come on, that's stupid. But in their mind, for the Pharisees, they were such keepers of the law, down to the letter of the law, instead of the spirit of the law, it was down to the letter of the law, that they just dismissed a lot of people. So they looked at this miracle, and they, they were like, well, that's great that you are, got healed after 38 years, but you can't carry that mat on the Sabbath. Like, I, I would see people like that. I probably would have smacked them with the mat. I would have been like, are you serious? Are you serious? Like, I've been carrying this mat for 38 years, and now you're mad because I got healed on the Sabbath? And I, I think this guy's more spiritual than I am, for sure. But, but I want to say this, because when I read about the Pharisees, I see people with a critical spirit. And there's something that happens whenever you develop a critical spirit. And it could happen to all of us. At times, I've developed a critical spirit. Maybe you do, what it looks like is, like in your marriage, when you're, in, instead of appreciating the fact that you, you, you've been married for a long time and you really do have a great spouse, you just seem to point out all of the negative things. And you just, every day, it's, hey, you didn't do this and you, this didn't get done. And th you can do that with your kids as a parent. If you're not careful, your kids will feel like, you never praise me. All you do is point out my flaws. That, that's what it means to have a critical spirit. Churches are filled with them. Um, it, for 20 years now as a pastor, it, it just floors me that it, there will be people who get baptized. Like we saw six people get baptized today. And, and somebody, no, one, no one's going to do this here. But I've had it in the past, someone come up, hey, that was really great. That bunch of people got baptized. And I, I enjoy seeing all the people get saved. But, uh, but I don't like that you did this. And I don't, you said something in your sermon that offended me. And I'm just like, were you just looking for something to get, get mad about? I mean, seriously, do, can, we just, can we not just rejoice in the fact that six people got baptized? But like, you, did you see all the kids that were in here? Like there were, through the years, I've literally had people tell me, hey, Pastor Joey, it's great. I'm glad that we have all these kids at our church. But can you just calm them down? Like they're, they're, they're just chaos. Like they're running. Can, can these kids not run in church? I'm like, who cares if they run in church? Just be glad they're in church. They could be running outside of church. So we have to be very careful because it sometimes is an either or. Would you rather have a church with no kids? Because that's your option. You could have that. But I would rather have a church full of kids where we just have to pull off our belt and spank them from time to time. I don't know. I'm just saying. <laughs> and that's the solution for sure. But anyways, uh, so let's just be careful um, careful about that. And so the Pharisees just, oh, and by the way, let me, let me I want to say this, okay. I had this in my notes. 
So Grace Church is not a perfect church. And the, you know why we're not perfect? Because I'm looking at a bunch of sinners. Like every one of you guys are sinful people just like me. And I don't get it right. Like I don't get it right in my marriage all the time. I don't get it right as a pastor or as a dad. But you know what? Our church, I think that we have an amazing church, an awesome church because of the people. The thing that makes it bad is also the main thing that makes it good. And sometimes people don't get along. But I just want you to understand, we're not a perfect church, and there are no such thing as perfect churches. And so if you leave on a pursuit and you go, I'm going to find the perfect church, if you find it, please don't join that church because you will ruin it. <laughs> the fact that you joined that church ruined the church because you're not perfect. And there are no perfect people. There are no perfect churches. So let's just... Here's what, this is really, like if you develop a critical spirit with, as a parent, as a spouse, as a person who goes to church, whatever it is, here's, make a conscious decision to praise people. Like make a conscious decision that you're going to praise your kids. Instead of getting on to them for everything, just tell, just name 10 things that you're thankful for. Them. And don't round it out, don't end it with, and then go clean your room, right? Or whatever, or you didn't, you forgot to do the dishes. Just praise them. Do that with your spouse. Do that. Just learn to, learn to look past all of the things that are wrong and just say, you know what, in spite of all of that, I'm going to focus on the positive. And that, that is a conscious decision that people make. All right, so let's, let's go on. Let's finish out the story. Um, here's what the guy said. But, but he replied, the man who healed me told me, pick up your mat and walk. And so they were upset. Verse, verse 12, who said such a thing? Uh, he, they demanded. The man didn't know for Jesus disappeared. He didn't even know Jesus' name. Like Jesus walked up to him, said, pick up your mat and walk. And he picked up his mat and he walked off. And then um, verse 14, it says, but afterwards, Jesus found him in the temple and told him, now you are well, so stop sinning or something even worse may happen to you. I mean, that's, that's serious business. Then the man went and told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who had healed him. Now, I want you to understand that about when Jesus said that to him. It re he wasn't threatening him really. It sounds like a threat. But it, he was just saying, you need to repent of your sins. Like that's what repentance is. It's, it's, hey, I'm doing this and I need to stop and I need to follow Jesus. And Jesus often did this. Like there was the time where in John chapter 8, we're going to get to that in a few weeks, where the woman caught in adultery. Like this woman was caught in the act of adultery and they threw her down at Jesus. And they were going to stone her to death. And Jesus, long story short, Jesus goes, did anyone condemn you? And then he goes, well, I don't condemn you either. It wasn't that he condoned her behavior. It wasn't that he goes like, hey, you're having an adulterous affair. You're sleeping with some woman's husband. You know, that's okay. That's not okay. But he was like, I'm not, I'm not going to throw stones at you and kill you. But what he told her, he goes, now go and sin no more. Now, now he, didn't, he, he didn't say, now go keep sleeping around. He was like, go stop, stop doing that. I, I love you and I'm not condemning you, but you got to quit living like that. You can't keep living like that. That's what repentance is. Anyway, so let me, uh, let me finish this out. Um, uh, ver verse 14, I, I, already, I already did that. Verse 15, then the man went and told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who had healed him. And so I want to wrap this up with, I got three questions, three or four questions for you. Here's the first question, because I want you to internalize this, this story that happened to this man. So everyone in here has got something wrong with us. We just do. You've got baggage. You've got a condition. You've got an ailment. Maybe it's an attitude. Maybe it's an addiction. Whatever it is. And the question is, do you want to get better? Now, I, I work with addicts and alcoholics all the time. And I will ask them, do you want to get better? Do you, do you, do you want to find some sobriety? And without fail, they'll say, yeah, sure I do. And then my next question is, are you willing to do whatever it takes and that will let you know if they really want to get better. Because I've talked to them and go, okay, well, here's what you got to do, okay? You got to do this, you got to do this and this. And they'll be like, oh, I don't want to do all of that. Well, okay, God bless you, have fun. Let me know when you're serious, you know, because I can't help you. I can tell you how to get better, but it's up to you whether or not you want to follow the advice. And so a lot of people are just not serious. But if you, in your situation, if you, like, I can't fix you, I can't heal you, I'm not, I'm not Jesus, but Jesus can absolutely heal your life, and he can fix what's wrong in your life. And then the second thing is this, is who, who, who or what are you trusting in? Like this man had superstitions that he was trusting in. And I just wonder if maybe there's something or someone else that you're looking to other than Jesus to find your healing. 
And it's not until we look to Jesus that we're going to find uh, fulfillment and healing. And then the last thing is, what are you waiting for? That's the last question. Like, what are you waiting for? There's people in this room. You've been, you've been talking about you, you, you're going to do something your whole life. You're like, one of these days I'm going to do this. One of these days I'm going to quit my job and go back to school. One of these days I'm going to do this. And, 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 and here you are and no change is happening, no action and so what are you waiting for? I'm, I'm reading this book right now. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end with this. It's called The Dream Giver by Bruce Wilkinson. Uh, Bruce Wilkerson, I think. And it's a, it's a good book. I'm almost done with it. And he just talks about how in life everyone, has, everyone in the world has a dream. And there are some people who are paralyzed and gripped with fear. And they... they the, the town, it's like a, it's like a parable. And the, the town, the village where the guy lives in is comfort zone. And he was like, you live in comfort zone. And some people get a dream and they try to move out and go pursue their dream. And there's always, barrier, there's always bullies is what he calls them. There's always someone quick to jump up. And, go, and it could be your mother, could be your father. But someone who loves you goes, no, 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 you can't do that. Like if you do that, you're going to fail. And you have to move beyond those people and you have to say, if God put this dream in my heart, I'm going to pursue it. And it doesn't matter who tells me I can or can't do it. I'm going to do it if God told me to do it. And some of you guys, you've been talking about doing something for a long time. And maybe it's time that you step out of your comfort zone and you start pursuing what it is that you're supposed to do.